Hello, I'm Mary Ito, and welcome to CRAM. CRAM is an acronym for Communicating Research and More, which is what we try and do on this podcast. A lot of exciting research and groundbreaking ideas never reach the public, but they have the potential to change the way we think and act. If I were to ask the question, what is beautiful? How would you answer that? I think there's a good chance your answer might differ from mine or someone else's. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as they say. And yet, there appears to be some common ground in our perceptions of beauty as well. Think about a rose in bloom, a beautiful spring day. I think many would agree that those are eternally beautiful. Are there underlying factors that affect how we perceive What is beautiful? What is the science behind beauty? It's a question that Daphne Maurer has been exploring. She's an experimental psychologist with McMaster University, and she and her husband, science writer Charles Maurer, are co-authors of the book, Pretty Ugly, Why We Like Some Songs, Faces, Foods, Plays, Pictures, Poems, etc., and Dislike Others. And Daphne joins me. Hello, Daphne. Thanks for coming on our podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I'm very excited about this topic. Um, I want to start off and ask you, first of all, why are you even interested in this question, what is beauty? Well, I'm a developmental psychologist. I study the development of perception and including how babies come to perceive some things as beautiful and other things as ugly. I've been working on that for many, many, many years, talking about it with my husband. But we got curious about whether there might be some common principles that apply beyond vision, but also to music and poetry, architecture, food. And we sought out, we set out to find out what those principles are. It took us 32 years. 32 years. 32 years, <laughs> the result is in that book that you mentioned. And the answer turns out to be remarkably simple. And we can talk about that today. Okay. Yeah, we absolutely are. Okay. So first of all, let me ask you, um, as far as considering beauty, uh, is that something that historically, I mean, goes way back since we existed as humans? Do we know? Um, man has, humans have decorated their dens for as far as we have any kind of evidence. Um, many animals do the same thing. They will decorate their nests or decorate, decorate their dens. So there seems to be some kind of proclivity to decorate and to have the decoration appreciated by those around you because it gets preserved, gets respected by others. Um, it turns out there are very few primitives. There are very few things that mean beautiful at birth without any experience. So we're born with a sweet tooth. We dislike bitter substances like coffee when we're born. We're attracted to patterns that have a certain kind of configuration. We like dark squares on light. So there's some very, we appreciate the octave. We appreciate the fifth. There's some very simple primitives that are built into how the human nervous system works. But everything else is learned. Everything else comes from learning and adapting to the environment. Okay. So can you can you give me more specifics around this? Um, when we talk about babies, maybe it's from the day they're born. I don't know. But you know, what starts to happen as far as w- once they can start to see clearly, you know, what's around them? Because I, I know that babies are very attracted to faces, for example. So like what's going on with that? And then sort of the future journey they're having towards what they consider beautiful and what they don't. So babies are attracted from, to faces from the moment they're born. They will look at them longer than most other patterns. But it turns out to be really simple physics. They're attracted to patterns where they can see an optimal amount of stuff going on. And their noses get in the way. So when they look at a face, 
It has two eyes here, very high contrast, good for the baby's poor vision. And there's a mouth here. They can see all this stuff up here, and that attracts their attention. We know this because psychologists have done these tests with babies, where you take the eyes and you turn them 90 degrees. So to us, it looks really distorted and tedious. For the baby, it's just as good because it still has just as much contour stuff going on in the top. But if you move the eyes down to the bottom of the face, it's no longer attractive to the baby. So the baby is attracted to patterns that don't get blocked by the nose, like the mother's face. Of course, mothers are putting their face right in the the attention span of the babies. So there's a mutual concordance, and mother's face becomes familiar. Babies recognize the mother's face before their one day, before their second day of life. Before their second day of life. Yep, it takes about eight hours of exposure, and the baby will recognize the mother's face and look at it longer than the face of a stranger, another baby's mother. So then what is going on as the baby matures? Um, they're looking at faces. You say that they spend longer looking at their mother's faces. I guess they're, they're absorbing all this information, right, uh, around them. So what, what, what is happening? So something very interesting starts to happen when they're three months old. They've been looking at faces. They've been beginning to remember some of the details of the face. But at three months, they start to average the various faces they see. So they're no longer looking at dad's nose, mom's nose, uncle's nose, aunt's nose. The brain is forming a prototype or average nose across all of those noses that have been seen. Same thing with the eyes. Here's an average shape of an eye. Here's the average distance between the eye. And by the time the baby is three months old, the average of what the baby has seen is preferred to any of the individual faces. It's become more attractive because what the brain is doing is this kind of statistical averaging across experience, forming a prototype of what is most familiar. And that becomes the most attractive face, almost the most attractive face I can show you. But how do we know this that to be true, that babies are taking this average of faces? Well, I was actually one who did that study with two other researchers <laughs> in London. So what we did is that we showed babies four individual faces, one at a time, each of them long enough for it to become familiar. So what's true throughout our lives is that we like the familiar, but not too much of it. So. Even at birth, I could show a baby, well, let's say two days of life after the baby has learned to recognize the mother's face, I could show the baby the mother's face preferred to a stranger. But if I show mom over and over and over and over again, the baby gets look, it's bored with looking at mom and switches to preferring the novel face of the stranger. So we took hmm. advantage of that novelty preference with babies who were three months old. We showed them four individual faces, all strangers. We showed them each long enough for them to become familiar. And then we gave them a test. And when we gave them a test and it was one of the familiar faces with a completely novel face, just as predicted, they looked longer at the novel face. But when we showed them the average, computer-generated average of the four individual faces we had just shown them, paired with something they had just seen, what they had just seen now seemed novel. In other words, that's a bit complicated. The average of what they had seen was more familiar to them, more boring because it was processed so easily than an individual face they had just seen. So that tells us that they are doing this kind of statistical averaging, forming prototypes in their head. And now when new things are seen, they'll be compared to that prototype. So are you saying that when you showed them that average face, even though 
it was a new it's face, totally right? Novel. Really? Te- it's a total, right. It's a new face, but it's made up of the patterns of, of the other faces they had seen. Yeah. That somewhere in a baby's brain registers that this is familiar. And so, oh, I'm used to seeing that. I'm now going to look at the completely new face. Absolutely. That's exactly what happens. Wow. And we, when we continue is- to do this. So, um, when I first looked at your face, Mary, my brain, we know from lots of studies that have been done in adults, didn't start to register all the individual features of your face and the shape of your jaw. It registered how your face is different from an average face. So it was registering your forehead is a little bit larger probably than the average face as mine is. Chin is a little bit smaller than the average face. My brain processed only the differences. We are attracted to how things are different from what we've experienced before. This is very efficient. So instead of carrying around in your head about thousands of faces you've seen in your life, you're carrying a representation of all these deviations. And so the, and okay, going back to then this composite, right? The average of all the faces that becomes beautiful, I guess, or the most attractive to a baby. Is it because it is a safe face? Because it is a comforting face easily and is safe. So we come okay. to find attractive the things that we process quickly and easily. I call them a kind of comfort food. They are safe. We've, we've experienced them before. Nothing terrible happened. And what we pay attention to are the little deviations from that. So imagine that you are um, in Africa. You're looking at a river. And there's a log floating down the river. But oh, there's a little protrusion. It might be a crocodile. That is going to attract your attention. We have adapted so that things that are like what we've experienced before feel safe. We find them attractive, but we are especially alert to small differences because they might signal danger. Right. Right. Okay. So l- let me give you this example then. Um, so if you have a child um, who's growing up and mostly sees family at the beginning, right? And then the baby's world expands to probably relatives and maybe some friends and neighbors. The people they're seeing at the very beginning, um, they might be all part of the same, well, literally, tribe. I mean, historically speaking, right? Or of the same culture. Right. So you have a baby growing up in China as opposed to a baby growing up in Nigeria or, a baby, you know, and so they're seeing kind of ethnically similar faces. Yeah. And then. Yeah. So would see, what does that mean then as far as now? What is their concept of beauty when that is what they're seeing rather than a, a diverse a range of features on faces? So they're learning faces, but they're also learning that faces should look like this one. And this one is going to be like the faces they've been seeing. And for babies, that's all one ethnicity. If you put a camera on a baby's head, even in the center of Toronto, very multicultural city, the people that come close to the baby so the baby can see the face, they're all the same ethnicity as the mom. So the baby's experience is limited. And these face prototypes we're talking about are built up to match the ethnicity of the parent. Now, this is adaptive. If you think about our environment of evolutionary adaptation, we needed to learn our tribe. We needed to learn which people is it safe to ask help from, which people is it safe to fall in love with, you know, which people belong to my group. So what the baby is doing in that first year of life is learning my people visually, Linguistically, they're learning the sounds of their language and starting to shut out the sounds of other languages, which when they were born, they could hear. They could hear the sounds of other languages and process them very well. Mm-hmm. By 12 months, they've shut them out. And they're learning what kind of food my tribe eats. You know? So they're becoming used to a certain diet. Um, and everything else is other. It's not processed deeply. 
it's just noted as other and potentially dangerous. And so then when is it that, um, again, they start to notice novelty and when do they appreciate and even crave novelty? So that's the interesting twist we discovered. So I said, we, we pay attention to things for a moment that are like what we've processed before, that's safe, that's comfortable, that's attractive. We're very alert to deviations because they might signal danger, but they might not. And when they don't, that is the exquisite beauty, that little twist on the familiar that is not dangerous. We learn what's dangerous and what's safe. So if I hand you your coffee with a chocolate on the saucer, that's just the right bitterness you prefer, or the dollop of whipping cream, that might be even better than your familiar coffee. If I go in the other direction and it's too weak, it probably tastes awful. Or if it's much too strong, it probably tastes awful. But that safe deviation makes it exquisite. The same thing with faces. So I've told you that an average face is attractive. That's true. Um, to when we're infants, that phenomenon is as strong in babies 12 month old as it is in adults. It's true all our lives, but I can make a face better than an average face. The way that psychologists have done that is they've taken a whole bunch of individual faces, all of which are rated as exceptionally beautiful, as more beautiful than an average face. You average together those more beautiful faces and you get a face that anybody would agree is more attractive. Let me ask you, though, um, when you say you take a group of beautiful faces, right? Well, who determines what those beautiful faces, who those beautiful faces well, you, are? You ask, you ask people to rate them. So you ask people to make ratings of um, hundreds of faces, oh. then if you take the ones uh -huh. rated with a consensus that they're most beautiful and you do a computer average of those. So when I talk about a computer average, what I mean is you're noting the um, coordinates, X, Y, coordinates of the tip of the nose, the edge of the nose, the tip of the mouth, the tip of the eyes, and you're averaging the coordinates and then you're moving each of the beautiful faces into those coordinates, so they all have the same coordinates, and then you do an average across them um, to get your most beautiful face. Okay, so I'm actually very interested, though, in these people who decide, okay, these are the most beautiful faces. I mean, is, is there sort of this common idea Absolutely. of what is beautiful? Absolutely. And that's why oh, it works. Okay. So if I um, bring a, um, a bunch of first-year undergraduates that's taking psychology into the lab, and I have a hundred of them um, rate a set of faces, there'll be good agreement in the ratings. If you take um, students in another country, there'll be good agreement on the ratings. And it's because... We've each seen thousands of faces. They average together. Your average is going to be very similar to my average. Wait a minute, but is that dependent on culture, though? Isn't that dependent on... It's dependent on culture to a little bit. By the time we're adults, our average, the average of a a bunch of Chinese faces and the average of a bunch of Caucasian faces and the average of a bunch of African faces, the averages start to converge because faces have the same proportions regardless of where you live. Our skin colors differ. Our hair colors differ. You know, our eyebrows differ. But where the eyes are located in the face and where the mouth occurs and where the nose occur. It's pretty similar across culture. So the averages come out looking very similar to each other. And so what you're doing is comparing to an average, you'll get similar ratings cross-culturally. Can you briefly just even describe what that face would look like? The average of all these beautiful faces? You know what I mean? Like, what, what's the nose like? What are the eyes like? Well, you know, what about the mouth? What, what are we looking at? I did another set of studies where I took faces 
And I put the cluster features, the eyes, nose, and mouth, in an average location in the face. I removed them way up almost to the limit of where they can go physically in human faces or way down almost to that limit. And I did this with a whole bunch of faces. So each person had three versions, average, low, and high features. When you show those to adults, they think the faces with the location average is best. That's predictable. So the features might not be average, but they're at least in the right place in the face. Low features are second best, and those are similar to children's faces. So those are similar to what we saw as we were growing up. And high features are really ugly. So I brought adults into the lab and I did a study with them where I showed them 40 faces and their job was to remember how many times have you seen this one before? And the answer might be once, it might be three times, it might be six times. So it's a really hard task to keep track of those 40 faces. And then I brought them down the hall and I said, I wonder if you could help me out with another study. It'll just take five minutes. So I told them it was independent and I showed them the face. It had the features all the way down, even farther than it's physically possible in the human um, structure of a face, all the way up. And they had a mouse and their job was to move the features into the most attractive location. Now, unbeknownst to them, one group had seen only faces with high features during that memory task. So they had had 15 minutes of exposure to high features. Another group had seen faces only with low features for that 15 minutes. And the th third group obviously got the average location. And just that 15 minutes of exposure pulled their preferred position in that direction. So if they had just seen high features, they put the features a little bit higher. If they had just seen low features, they put them a little bit lower. So we're updating this average all the time, but it's essentially the features in the, uh, in the middle of the face as we, mo we most often see them. And by the way, babies don't have this preference. Babies spend their lives looking up at faces. So they get a lot of chin and they get four, uh, four shortened foreheads. And they like the faces with high features, which are like their experience. All chin, little forehead. The ones we find uh, ugly. Yeah, yeah. So just to just to be clear too, when you say low features and high features, that you you mean literally, right? That the features are lower on the face and the features are higher on the took, face for the we high took features. The entire cluster of features from eyebrows to mouth yeah. and moved to, them down right. or moved them up. Right. Move them up, yeah. When you said that people were shown pictures of faces that were um, uh, high up, and those were considered, I guess, ugly, Yeah. when they were actually exposed to them for a, a certain length of time, I think it was 15 minutes, they actually, I guess, didn't perceive them to be as ugly. That's right. Is that right. correct? Right. Okay. So what, is that, what does that say then with exposure? to things that are not attractive. So now I'm talking about things that are not not beautiful, that are in fact ugly. If we are exposed more and more to something that is perceived as being ugly, do we actually think of it as being less ugly over time? That's how the fashion industry manipulates us every season. <laughs> I mean, think about it. The, the hemlines go up. <laughs> oh, isn't that ugly? I can't believe what that... Um, girl is wearing, and three months later, we're replacing our wardrobes because our old clothes now look funny to us. So, yes, these um, attractiveness preferences can be changed by exposure at any age, just as I did in the lab with the high features and low features. You can do it with fashion. Um, you can do it with... Um, Body shape and size. So the prefer ideal body has become thinner over time. So if you go back to the paintings of Rubens, those naked women were quite plump. 
by our standards, but not by the standards of the day. And then if you go a couple centuries later, the nude women painted as goddesses, so it was okay to paint them, um, are much thinner. Same thing can be done in the lab. So uh, um, Jill Rhodes did a study where she had people come in and she had body shapes, female body shapes, nude um, silhouettes, and you had to pick the most attractive um, body shape and size. And then for one minute, she showed them an extremely thin person or an extremely fat person. And then she tested them again, and their ideal had shifted. Just one minute of exposure, and I, their ideal had shifted. So all of our preferences are constantly being updated. And this is an evolutionary adaptation. Because imagine you go to a new environment. You better be able to quickly process what's new and distinctive in that environment and figure out whether or not it's safe. You would be updating all your averages in that new environment. Well, that mechanism is with us every single day, updating what is our prototype, what is easily processed, and hence causing small shifts in what we see as ideal. You know, just going back, though, to fashion, um, how much has to do with exposure and how much has to do with kind of a herd mentality, you know, and people, let's say, who are considered influencers, right? The designers, the people who control the fashion houses, that sort of thing, dictating to us saying this is now what is beautiful. This is what is in fashion. And then you have all these people who follow suit and say, oh, yes, I'm going to wear that this spring, right? That's the new thing this season. And so here we are thinking, oh, well, all these people are going to be wearing that. I guess I should too. Of course, there's that influence as well. Um, We can't leave that out. But what I'm talking about is the new fashion coming to look right. So you're doing it because it actually feels right, feels good when you put it on, not just because you're copying the herd, because it's come to be familiar and right. And when you put on your old clothes, that's funny. Um, but if you're smart, you'll save your old clothes because it will cycle back. You know, and regarding what we once considered to be attractive, so, you know, plump, plump women in Ruben's time. I mean, why were they considered attractive, though? I mean, weren't they considered attractive because... They they had the money probably, to be well probably fed. Probably where that came from. That um, um, it would have started out probably because it was a symbol of wealth and prestige. But then it became what people were used to. So it would have spread throughout society and become the ideal for people who weren't trying to show off their wealth. It became the societal ideal through familiarity, even though it started off no doubt, as a symbol of wealth. What is it about us that we need to constantly change our ideas of beauty? I don't know that I've said that we do. We have this mechanism that's adaptive Mm -hmm. that we're constantly updating our expectations. We're constantly updating our prototypes, our networks, so we know what to expect, what is familiar so that we can process it more quickly and pay attention to the things that might be dangerous. So the changes in beauty come along with that adaptive mechanism. Because we're constantly updating our neural structures to represent our expectations based on experience, and because those prototypes are what we find attractive. A little better with a twist, but other than that, they are what we find attractive. We're going to be constantly updating the details of what we find beautiful. But because the experience of you and me is so similar, we're going to end up with very similar ideals. What does it mean now with, you know, humans being able to travel and live pretty much anywhere around the world. We have such a diverse range of experiences and people 
that we encounter, right? So perhaps babies today encounter a diverse number of people like never before. What what kind of impact would that have on beauty or would it have any impact on beauty? Well, actually, it turns out in the first year of life, babies don't get exposed to much diversity. They're pretty, Uh they're pretty homebound. They're exposed to relatives. The people who come up on the street and approach the carriage and say, oh, look at that beautiful baby. They match the ethnicity of the mom. They're female. I mean, the experience is really quite limited in the baby's first year of life. Um, And those preferences that are laid down in the first year, I'm going to speculate, are the origin of our implicit biases. So you can later on develop with no explicit bias You can get rid of an explicit bias you have. It's very hard to get rid of that gut feeling that something is wrong. And that gut feeling... You mean that they're not my tribe? It's not my tribe. That they're not my tribe? Yeah. And that gut feeling, those gut feelings develop in the first year of life. Um, I I Hmm. think you, you can modify them very readily in the first year of life. So you can Mm -hmm. send a storybook home with a baby that has just six individuals of an unfamiliar ethnicity who are named. They need to be individuals and then get the mom to read that story over a month. And you can undo the baby's avoidance of that ethnicity. So it's very, very plastic in one year of life. But our experience tends to remain fairly homogeneous from age one to age two. So unless, let's say, the baby's exposure was radically different from the beginning of life, you're saying those kinds of biases are pr- pretty pretty solid and difficult to change. They're, they're, they're pretty solid. Um, babies can be exposed to more than one tribe. That's what happens in bilingualism. The mom speaks one language. The dad speaks a different okay, language. Right. The baby yeah. will learn both languages with no bias between them, but there'll be a bias against the third language. So the baby may learn English and Japanese, but become indifferent to French. And Oh, this is interesting. You know what, though? You raised something interesting now because we are seeing, I mean, so many mixed partnerships, right? Um, And so you would be getting diversity there. And then not only that, when I think about how the family is changing. And you are getting now families that are blended from birth. Um, You're getting families that have two mothers and a father or two fathers and a mother or, right? So this is now changing things for the baby. It may change things. Absolutely. Although I expect as, as in the bilingualism case, the baby will learn I'm part of two tribes because now they're going to see not only parents of different ethnicities, but relatives of different ethnicities. So they may learn these are my two tribes, but the third tribe is still foreign. There'll still be mm-hmm. an implicit bias mm-hmm. against the third tribe. Right. But you, but you did say, though, it is possible to change. And right? it's very it is possible around 12 months of age. There are lots of studies that 12, have done mm-hmm. in labs with exposure, exposure to a video, exposure to a story. It's, it's very classic then. So reading the baby's stories about multiple cultures at that point probably could make a difference. So what do you make of then once we become adults and we've had different experiences, right? So my experiences are different from yours. Um, and then what happens to our perception of beauty as we become adults and have varying experiences? Well, our perceptions of beauty will differ. Let's talk about taste. I think that one's pretty easy. Um, All of us would dislike the uh, flavor of coffee at birth. It's bitter. The baby would scrunch up a face and spit it out. But many of us have learned to enjoy coffee, probably challenged by a peer at some point to try it, spitting it out when we first tasted it. But drinking it repeatedly and becoming used to it and becoming very, very fussy about exactly which beans 
roast of how long, how strong our coffee is, <laughs> and Starbucks and espresso thrive on this, that we have these particular preferences. And your preference is probably different from my preference. So we've had different experience, and we've ended up with different preferences. But we all started, both started off with a sweet tooth. We, you have it in the womb, in fact. If the, if the amniotic fluid is sweetened with saccharin, the fetus laps it up. So that sweet tooth is as close as anything to being innate. Developmental psychologists don't like using the word innate because everything is an interaction and depends on the right environment and temperature. But it's certainly close to being innate. Um, but how sweet we like our coffee, if at all, probably differs between us. I can't stand sugar in my coffee. Um, so but our experience has modified that basic preference. But we're similar in that we started off disliking bitter and loving sugar. All of the things I've been talking about are multimodal because in the real world, unlike the experimental psychologist's labs, you don't ever just see something or just hear something or right. just smell something. You're getting all of them at once. And all of them influence how you react, whether it seems familiar or not. So if there's music playing, then the music is familiar. And you start moving to the music because we do that. We move to music. And you see the other person is moving to the same beat. That binds our brains together. Our brains respond to seeing someone else move, seeing movement, and feeling ourselves move at the same time. And then you smell oatmeal cookies baking, and your mom used to always bake oatmeal cookies. It's that whole conglomerate which will influence whether or not I find something beautiful or not. If I'm in an art museum and it's crowded, it's noisy, I can barely hear myself think, my reaction to the paintings I'm looking at will change. Um, oh my goodness, Daphne, we could go on and on and on about this, but if there is um, one thing out of your work in this area that you know, you could kind of say that this is one sort of important finding or something that uh, I just want to leave people with. Like, what what would it be about all this research you've done on beauty and, and humans and human nature? <laughs> well, one thing we haven't talked about is the, the heavy influence of um, facial and body attractiveness and how we are evaluated. Huge literature documenting Hiring decisions, promotion decisions, um, whether or not you're listened to when you give a presentation, really heavily influenced by facial and bodily attractiveness. That, I mean, there's really no getting away from that because that emerges from this evolutionary adaptation to find attractive, to pay attention, to, ha to have stand out people who are easily processed because they match our prototype. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I think it's kind of important to be aware of that. You're not going to get rid of it because it comes out of this evolutionary adaptation. But being aware of it means you can do blind hiring. They do that now in orchestras where people play behind the yes. screen so that you're you know this is a big influence. If it's a situation in which you want it not to influence you, try to take some steps to um, minimize its impact. And then accept. We have this evolutionary adaptation. It allows us to survive and allows us to get immense pleasure from finding so many things beautiful while other things are ugly. <laughs> uh, did you enjoy doing this, by the way, this research, even though it took you over 30 years? Um, we enjoyed, yes, we enjoyed finishing it. I can tell you that much. Um, <laughs> but it, it was an exploration. We were um, updating our own 
understanding of the history of the arts. So we had to go to all kinds of concerts, all kinds of museums, talk to museum curators, talk to architects, dig back into the writing of the Greek. So it, it was it was a fun journey. Uh, and then when the, the, the commonalities, the picture emerged, that was a eureka moment. It's been a fun journey for me speaking with you, Daphne. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed it immensely. That's Daphne Maurer. She's an experimental psychologist with McMaster University, and she and her husband, science writer Charles Maurer, are co-authors of the book, Pretty Ugly, Why We Like Some Songs, Faces, Foods, Plays, Pictures, Poems, etc., and Dislike Others. For more information on Daphne and her research, please check out our show notes. Our thanks to the Temerty Foundation for their generous support. And you might also be interested in our literary podcast called Passage to Wonderland. I highlight compelling passages from books that offer discovery, insight, and a sense of completion for the end of your day. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you here next time.